Well, good evening to you. Welcome. This is Ghana Tonight. We are live from a news up here at Desawe Kanda. Also live on 23 Ghana on Facebook, the SCV Channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. Coming up tonight, the West African Examinations Council, WAEG, is concerned about arrears owed them by government of Ghana as the 2023 Basic Education Certificate Examinations as BEC begins with over 600,000 candidates sitting for the exam. We'll tell you what's happening. Stay with us. Also, the economic community of West African states echoes to invade Niger as ultimatum ends. We have the trajectory of the situation in Niger and what experts are saying and how that is also possibly going to impact on the prices of onions in Ghana if things continue. Stay with us. Also, a 35-year-old man, it's in remand, for uh, allegedly defiling minors in Wa tonight. We are in the Upper West region for a detailed analysis of this, this particular story here on Ghana tonight. There's been some reactions already from Child Rights International, but Tapia is going to be joining us as we have a conversation on this. As always, we're very, very interactive. Let's hear from you. The hashtag we're using is Ghana tonight on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Connect with us and let's get talking tonight. Let's settle for Ghana Brief. The start of this year's basic education certificate examinations has generally been smooth, except for the Setra Afram Plains district of the Ashanti region, where a river overflow affected transportation of examination materials. Uh, no casualty in terms of absentees or somebody falling sick. We have decided on the smooth route. So we are only hoping and praying that at the end of it all, everything will go on smoothly as planned. What we are doing is not different from what Wayek has asked us to do. But we made sure that we have recruited men and women of integrity to invigilate and supervise over the children. So as you have come, you can see that the whole place is calm. You don't see people loitering around. No, we have put those measures in place. The police in Kumasi is on a manhunt for a young man alleged to have stabbed his friend to death. The deceased, Lambert Frimpong, is a 23-year-old second-year history and politics student at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. Even though nothing can be done to bring back our brother, arresting and prosecuting the perpetrator will assuage our pain. We have suffered a big loss. Wherever the suspect is, I believe that the police will hunt for him and arrest him. And once he's arrested, definitely we will hear more uh, from the suspect do not live around Quadra here. He stays around Bokrum and uh, Timothy Masi. So definitely the police, once they are aware of his uh, hideouts, they will definitely go around and search for him. A circuit court in Wa has remanded a 35-year-old local master of ceremony accused of defiling 12 children into police custody to reappear on Monday, August 14. The accused, Rashid Ahmed, a.k.a. Anata, is facing seven counts of defilement, contrary to Section 1012 of the Criminal Offences Act 1960, Act 29. There are still some few loose ends that we need to tie. Police will continue with the investigation. But because of the interest generated, we intend to do a daily trial of this matter. We have already prayed to the court to let us do a daily trial of this matter beginning Monday. So we should have served him with all the necessary documents by Wednesday so that we can start the trial on Monday. And thankfully, if he get a daily trial, we might end this case in just two weeks. Former Deputy Finance Minister Keso Atoforsen has withdrawn a motion against the judge hearing the financial offences against him and two others. The minority leader had accused Justice Ifya Sewa Asaribuchi of bias in the sale of ambulance trial. But in court on Monday, August 7, lawyer Gordon Tamaklo, holding brief for Dr. Abdul Basid Bamba, told the courts that they would like to withdraw the motion filed for the judge to recuse herself. The court hence struck out the motion as withdrawn.
Oh, there's more news on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. Coming up next here on Ghana Tonight, the West African Examinations Council is concerned about the arrears owed it by government of Ghana as the 2023 Basic Education Certificate Examinations as BC begins today with over 600,000 candidates sitting for the exam. And in fact, this has actually generated some concern, especially because of the implications of these areas, according to WAIEC, and, and the fact that if the monies don't come in early, it could affect them in performing certain duties after this exam. My colleague, Dennis Wadam, has been looking through the books to get the exact picture of how much WAIEC is owed or is expecting from government. Dennis, what have we found? Well, so according to WAIC, they would need about 70 million Ghana cities approximately to be able to conduct the entire um, basic um, ex education certificate examination, which mm -hmm. is the BEC. And of this 70 million, so far they have received 10.5 million Ghana cities, and that represents 15%. Now, knowing that we have over 600,000 candidates sitting in for this exam, if you do the simple mathematics of dividing the amount of money that is required by WAIC to organize this exam, it would mean that WAIC will essentially be spending 116 CDs approximately on each candidate for the purpose of this exam. Mm -hmm. Now WAIC is saying that the money they've received so far, they've been able to use that for the printing and all the things that are needed for the exam to kick start. We know the exam has started today and it will run for the next um, few days. Hopefully by the end of the week, the exam will be over. But Waik says that if they do not get the rest of the money in the coming days, it will be very difficult for them to continue uh, with the other parts of the examination, which will include the marking and other things that will uh, um, be needed to be done with respect to the exam. So by way of figures, this is what we have and this is what we do know. So what it essentially means is that um, the government would have to pay Waik 59.5 million cities more to be able to finish up with the exam and have everything done with. Mm, that's the marking and, and all of that. Yes. I see. But so stay with me, Dennis. Let's get some quick reactions on this. Dr. Clement Park is uh, the ranking, deputy ranking on the Education Committee of Parliament. He's the Bosa South Member of Parliament as well. Thank you so much for your time here on Ghana Tonight, Dr. Clement Park. Did, did this, this area that Wyke is talking about, did it come to the attention of the committee before you went on recess as, as parliament, I mean the education committee, if, if it did, did you get any updates on when this area is going to be cleared? First of all, this never came to the committee, but uh, those of us on the NDC side in parliament, uh, we, we raised the issue by addressing the press in parliament, calling attention to government's indebtedness uh, to WAIC uh, and outstanding areas. Uh, going back to, to last year, uh, government then made us aware that it had made provision as announced by the Deputy Minister for Education, Reverend Tukum Fodjo, for WAIC to be able to undertake uh, its uh, obligations. So it comes to us as a shock and a surprise that WAIC is now telling us that contrary to what government had indicated, only a paltry 10 million out of about 70 million uh, has been provided. So we would like to call government to immediately make the resources available to WAIC. Because if that does not happen, after the papers have been written, they wouldn't be marked and they, they wouldn't be graded. And uh, this is a very dire situation that calls for agent uh, action by government. I see. But also, if you, you knew, I mean, that there was a situation, but then WAIC came out to say something to the contrary. Now, this has come up. You are on recess as parliament, though. But then again, the question is, what can be done to ensure that the fears that WAIC is, is expressing, that, look, if we don't get this money, we can't even mark the papers, would not materialize? So, and I fail to understand why, year in, year out, budgetary allocations are made and approved to support all the three tiers of education. And yet, in particular, government seems to shortchange basic education. As we speak, capitation grants are in arrears of seven terms. This is the equivalent of two years 
and more. And as I've said, time on that number, these are the, the monies that head teachers use to procure chalk, attendance registers, to fix broken down doors and, and windows, to, to fund culture and sporting activities. And so to think that government owes capitation grants in excess of two years is unconscionable. This cannot be acceptable. Again, it is not just in the area of capitation grants. Government also owes those who were contracted to produce textbooks to complement the new standard-based curriculum. And because of this, the, the publishing houses have not been able to produce sufficient books to supply to our public basic schools. So as we speak, not even one public basic school in Ghana has a full complement of textbooks based on the new standard-based curriculum. So you ask yourself this, is government truly serious about education in this country? And if government is serious, that seriousness ought to be demonstrated by government meeting its obligations as far as basic public education is concerned. Okay. We are not seeing that. It is time for teacher unions, it is time for parents and civil society organizations to call government out for failing to meet its obligations as far as public basic education is concerned. We cannot tolerate this type of conduct from a government which we pay our taxes to, which has an obligation to ensure that teaching and learning at every level, okay. and in particular at the basic level, goes on smoothly. Okay, but we are not seeing that. Dr. Clementa Park, you know, what has the president been, okay, in the time release of funds to WAEC to finance this BC in, in, in the past? How, how, how has it been? Because anytime this comes up, in fact, the reaction from the education ministry is that, look, this is not the first time. And so is it really the case? Well, it is the case that there's always been a lag between when WAIC undertakes its obligations and when government, you know, makes payments. We are seeing a rather exacerbated situation where now WAIC is even making it clear that the government does not move very quickly to add more to the 10 million Ghana cities uh, given to WAIC. WAIC will not be able to fulfill these obligations in terms of conducting the exams, uh, getting invigilators to invigilate, getting supervisors to supervise, and getting examiners to mark the scripts and to prepare the results. So the current situation is unprecedented, to say the least. I see. But then again, uh, any, just a bit away from this YX situation, uh, you say that capitation grant is in areas of what? Six terms? That's like two years? In addition to this term, it's seven terms in areas. Seven terms. That is how dire the situation is. It is so bad to the extent that head teachers have gone on basis to take chalk attendance to try and keep our Alfred. It is terrible. It is uh, terrible, wow. to say the least. Uh, but, and, and, and did you as MPs or the Education Committee uh, at any point get any updates on when this capitation grant is going to be paid, uh, the arrears? Because if it's seven terms, that's, if you have three terms in a year, that's like two years, a little over two years, right? And the headmasters, from what you're saying, are borrowing, taking loans to run the school. That's did you get any updates? Well, we raised the questions. We found a number of questions. And in fact, believe you me, the finance minister, when he came on the 31st of July to present the media budget statement, actually sought to boast to the effect that capitation grants had been increased. And I said, no. You can't say capitation grants have been increased when, in fact, you owe and you have not paid. And as a result of those areas, head teachers are struggling to keep public basic schools running. So I, I don't know why this government, and in particular the finance minister, can talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. Why do you come and tell us that because of capitation grant and the increase in the grant, this has increased 
you know, enrollments. One at the same time, we know that for the last two years, you have not remitted even one persona in lieu of capitation grants. So they are not being honest. They are being deceitful. And I think very soon the chickens will come home to roost. Very soon the headmasters would refuse to take loans. And in fact, parents are going to have to bear the brunt. In some instances, as we are beginning to pick up across the country, parents are funding basic education for their wars. When that shouldn't be the case. Hmm. Dr. Clementa Park. Oh, I appreciate your time here on Ghana tonight and, and this detail as well. And this is an issue that, in fact, we're going to, to, to take quite seriously and, and keep the steam on this, this capitation grant to matter. Uh, but let's stay a bit further with the BEC because there's another issue that's also developing in there. Dennis, you've been looking at the numbers in terms of the breakdown and also the, uh, the past, how, how the situation has been. What are we looking at? Well, so we've been looking at the numbers over the past 10 years, and this is kind courtesy um, African Education Watch. They put this together. But when you look at the data, there's a lot to say about it. But the first striking thing that you see about the data is the fact that when you look at this particular year, where you have over 600,000 candidates sitting for the exam, mm -hmm. you would see that when it comes to the female representation, you have over 300,000 candidates sitting for that exam this year. I see. And that represents 50 point zero one when you look through the previous years like i said at least for the past 10 years mm -hmm. you'd see that this 50 percent is the first time it is occurring so it means that for this exam we have females being more than males sitting for the exam at least for the 10 years that african education watch has done this mind you the bc has been going on for the past 33 years mm -hmm. but this is just for 10 years i see so that's a very good context that yes. you, put, put, you put in. in the here. other thing that strikes us when you look at this data is the, 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 the growth year on year. So when you look at the year on year growth on totals, you'd appreciate that from 2014 to 2015, no, 2013 to 2014, mm -hmm. the difference was 8.5%. It means yeah. that there was an increase of 8.5%. Mm. Um, the following year, it increased by 3.5%. It increased again by 5.2%. There have always been increases, except that when you look at the increase this particular year, it appears to be the second, or in, in fact, it is the second highest increase within the last 10 years. I see. So that is also something that stands out um, in this particular data. Now, there's also been another issue which African Education World raises. Mm -hmm that these candidates we are looking at today, they went to school in 2012, 2013 academic year. That's, that's when they entered, that's when they entered school. the education system. KG1 enrollments. That's how they captured it. So the people who entered in KG1 yes. are the ones who are writing BC today. BC today. I see. And per the data, that the people who entered KG1 in 2012, 2013 were 906,942. By the time they are writing BEC today, mm -hmm. they are now 600,714. What that, it means is that 33.8% of them got missing in the system. That's over 300,000. Yes. That's what 300,000 students or peoples, I mean peoples, got missing in the system. And that is why African Education Watch is saying that we need to be able to account for all of these. Interesting point. Now, there. for the girl factor that we are looking at, mm -hmm. at the time they were in KG1, the girls were 450,474. By the time they got to JSS3, now today they are writing their, their BEC, mm -hmm. they are over 300,000. What that also means is that Some in their case, 33.3 .3 of them got missing in the system. That's about 150, over 150,000 girls Precisely. Who, who, who started KG1 yes. in 2012 and exactly. should have been part of this group. Interesting. So when you continue to look at the data, this now talks about the percent, uh, percentage growth or increases per the male and the female factor. So mm -hmm. when you look at the, the blue, the blue indicates the male, the ash or gray, depending on how you are looking at it, indicates the female. So you would appreciate that 
Um, so when you look at the groove, actually, so the lines are the zigzag lines. Mm -hmm. When you look at the, the yellow line, that indicates the growth for the male. And then the red is the female. So right. you would see that from 2014, the female growth appreciates. It appreciates again to 2016, then declines in 2017. It appreciates in 2018, declines in 2019, um, remains a bit stable around 2019, 2020, goes up in 2021, dips in 2022 and now shoots up again in 2023. So there's a lot to say about this. It's more like a zigzag, but now we happen to be at the upper part of it. So this is the data that uh, Africa Education Watch put together with respect to uh, BEC as it is in the last 10 years. 10 years. I see. Interesting stuff there. And then Dennis, because there, there are some last two that you show, but Kofi Asari is joining us um, because they, the, that's the source of this data, is it not? The yes. Africa Education Watch, Executive Director of Africa Education Watch. Kofi, thank you so much for joining us on Ghana tonight. First of all, uh, that that 300,000 gap we see, I mean, in, in 2012, what, what you showed us that uh, the children or the pupils who are sitting for the BC today who entered KG in 2012 was 900,000. 600,000 are sitting now. With your research, were you able to identify what had accounted for the uh, rate of fallouts that led to this 300,000 not sitting for the BEC today? Well, um, our analysis of the survival, uh, the core survival of the current um, batch of students undertaking the BEC, I mean, writing the BEC, suggests that, yes, between 2012, when they enrolled in kindergarten one, and 2023, that's today, the number has reduced from 900,000 to 600,000. Numerically, the implication is that 300,000 have left the school environment or the education system because they are not writing the BC. Bear in mind that Ghana's basic education system does not end without one writing the BC. And so it, the meaning is that they have not finished basic education. We are worried in the sense that it gives the impression that about 33% of our students are not surviving within the 11 year basic education journey, even though they start. And that is a great source of worry to every education system, including Ghana's education system. We are aware that some may have meandered to go and pursue international programs like Cambridge, International Baccalaureate. Some may have traveled. Some may have unfortunately died. But this is these are just you know very, very low insignificant numbers, which I'm not too sure will be up to even 10% of the 300,000 that we want to find out where they are. And so we at African Education Watch are also committed towards ensuring that we do further research to track and find out the possible you know feeders, I mean the, um, where the children really are. Um, because dropping out is just um, not enough. We need to ascertain the drivers of the dropout, what are the facilitators, and where are they now, you know, so that we can help government, you know, redirect policy to ensure that retention is prioritized within our basic education system if indeed um, the majority of the, the children dropped out uh, as, from the basic I education see, system. But what should be the immediate intervention the government should be considering to address this? dropout rate between the kindergarten period all the way to when they sit for BC, Kofi? Immediately, government, civil society, development partners must have a convening to converse, to converse on the issue of cohort survival, survival within our basic education system. That is immediate. Within the context of the convening, we must have a discussion on undertaking a tracer study for this cohort to ascertain exactly where the 300,000 children are. Find out what could likely, you know, have been the, the cause of the dropout rates, even though we are very much, you know, aware about the key drivers of dropout, but find out scientifically what may have attributed to the, the high dropout rate. And then, most importantly, fashion out long-term strategies and immediate interventions with a view to 
curbing and reducing the risk of dropout so that in subsequent years we won't be seeing um, high high levels of dropout or very very low um, survival rate especially in some part of the country if you look our analysis focus on the national level but if you do a cursory analysis okay and focus on these regions like the northern region the northeast region and then the savannah region you will come to the understanding that about 40 percent of students who enroll in kindergarten one are not writing bc that is higher than the 33 percent that we have identified at the national level and that must give you a clue that there's a correlation between poverty levels uh, and deprivation in the education system exactly and the survival rate because it, that part and it, it's that is that correlation that i'm talking about the poverty level the, even the conditions of the uh, where they are as well because what we, we, we saw today is that candidates, Kofi, writing the examinations in the Sechara Farm Plains uh, district of the Ashanti region did located our communities are in that part of the country. And so if you do an analysis of transition between primary six and junior high school one, you realize that close to over 20% of students drop out. In fact, in some in some districts, it's up to about 40% drop out between primary six and junior high school one alone because they have to commute 10 kilometers to school to the nearest junior high school after completing primary six and where the distance is not manageable especially for girls who cannot be doing that for a long time they drop out so the major cause of dropout in the northern region apart from poverty is a distance commuted to school at junior high school one because 60% of primary schools in the northern region do not have access to junior high schools. That is the major cause. But as I said, we need further studies to ascertain beyond the northern regions, even in urban Ghana, ascertain the survival dynamics, what are the drivers, what are the facilitators, and how this can be curbed in the, in the medium term, in the short term, and not in the long term. And um, that is why we need further research into this matter. This is a matter that must concern everyone because it lies at the heart of the objective of free compulsory universal basic education, which is not just a policy by a constitutional provision. And so we must all be concerned that close to 30% of happening. our children, who, according to the ministry's data, started kindergarten one in 2012, did not write to the BC. Uh, that's that's serious to say the least. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Kofi Asari, uh, Executive Director of the Africa Education Watch, um, giving some details on it. But Dennis, uh, as we round up, just a summary of the picture as you have um, chronicled over time for our viewers. Well, so often I think what Kofi has done is a great job. Um, what we need to do now is also be able to establish how many more, how many students also got lost in the system between 2012 and 2022. Um, 2011 and 2021, mm -hmm. or better still, we can use what he has done now as the base for what will happen next year, so that we can now have a comparison of 2014 and then 2024, just so we are able to see whether we're making progress or not. But it's important to establish that even on the face of the data, between 2013 and 2023, we have made some progress. Because when you look at the number of candidates who sat for 2013 um, BEC, that's 391,079. Mm -hmm. When you compare that to what we have today, that's a huge gap. Of it has almost more than 50% increment. When you also look, what it means is that now we have a lot more people um, attaining at least basic education than it was before 10 years, than it was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. When you also look at the number of um, schools that were presented in 2013, mm -hmm. 11,778. Now you have over 18,980 schools writing BEC. So it means that we are making progress. And the more we look into the numbers to see where the, the, the loopholes are and to block them, the better for us all. Indeed, the better for us all. Dennis, Dam, thank you so much for running through the data with us to give us a full picture of uh, what we're dealing with here on Ghana tonight. Coming up next, we go straight to the upper, upper West region uh, where we're going to talk about the update on this uh, situation with the pedophiles and earlier the story that a 35 year old man is in remand for an alleged defiling of minors in Wa 
Tonight, we are in the Upper West Region for the updates of this story and other issues of child rights abuse. Stay with us. There's... Gentlemen, we're going to demonstrate to you the superior properties of Flamingo paint as compared to other paint brands on the market. We take equal quantities of Flamingo paint and this ordinary paint. We then dilute them with water. And now, let the test begin. The gentleman on the left is going to apply the ordinary paint and the gentleman on my right will use the Flamingo superior paint. As you can clearly see, Flamingo has the obvious better hiding. Furthermore, Flamingo has painted a much larger area. You know, one bucket of Flamingo paint is equal to several buckets of any other paint brand on the market. Flamingo paint is made with superior formulation to give superior durability, superior hiding, superior coverage. Flamingo paint, simply superior. What does winning mean to you? For Yao, it's seeing the joy in his mother's eyes after he provided her with a state-of-the-art kitchen to cook her signature unapu jollof. It's a mega win. For Ajua, it's turning her passion for photography into a successful career while providing her children with the best education possible. It's a mega win. For Kwame, it's becoming his own boss and starting his music business. It's a mega win. Whatever winning means to you, Mega 6 Lotto can help you achieve it in grand style. With only 49 numbers to choose from, the odds are always in your favor. Play with as little as two Ghana CDs for a chance to win millions of CDs every week. Download our Android and iOS apps. Dial star 266 hash or visit Mega6Lotto.com to make a mega impact on your life and the lives of others. Mega 6 Lotto. Mega winnings, mega impact. The Mega 6 Lotto is regulated and monitored by the NLA. Everybody knows Acrobato. And if you know Acrobato, it means you know M Punch Homeopathy Clinic. M Punch Homeopathy Clinic is my pillar. Let's hear what others are saying about M Punch Homeopathy Clinic. Who will be careful M Punch Wana? Ha! And everything me do so sema na nkoye e person na my emre nyina na me gina sabema na me no be fie for there e ho na nyina e ji arisa you got everything i have secret m point is my secret m point from your party clinic i'm free hey, hey. what do you do with some cool 2000 okay 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 the to win game show is exactly what you need You are already rich before you begin to pay. Every week, two lucky people stand the chance of winning money. All you have to do is go through some quizzes and funding. Somebody from Peru is called Perushi. Eh? Whatever you say, you have to be proud because your family people are watching. You. Somebody from Madagascar is called Malagasy. Correct! Okay, let's go, let's go. Uh -uh. It's you that will tell me, let's go. <laughs> you are not even winning. <laughs> Okay. Hold the stand and gently back. Amazing. Don't go. Don't go. Don't go. Don't go. Are you Ama? Be proud. Okay. First of all, is Aikwe supposed to be a man or a woman? Put it on your forehead. Are okay. <laughs> Be a part of this game show right here on TV3 and take on some. Oh my God. <laughs> Come join us on Here to Win Game Show, where you win it all. Hey, mama! Hey, mama! Hey, Here to Win! Here to Win, premiering on Saturday, 12 August at 8 p.m. on TV3.
Welcome back to Ghana Tonight. A 32-year-old local master of ceremony, the MC Rashid Ahmed, is facing prosecution for allegedly defiling 10 girls in the Upper West Regional Capital of Wa. He is currently facing a total of 10 counts of defilement and indecent assault of a minor contrary to Section 10 and 103 of the Criminal Offences Act. The prosecution has told the Wa High Court the accused lured the victims after becoming acquainted with them. Let's hear from the state attorney um, on, on this particular issue. Now, Saeed Abdul Shakur is the principal state attorney who spoke to the media after today's court proceedings. And my colleague, Wang, Ibrahim Wangara, was there for us. Take a look. Today, the alleged pedophile was arranged before court and charged with 11 counts of sexual assault on minors between the ages of 10, 11, 13, 14, and the oldest was 15 years. Immediately, the matter was reported to the police. The accused person took a flight from the jurisdiction. He later on spoke to radio stations and indicated that he was advised to go out of the country until calm returns. He sneaked back into the country and the police, thanks to their intelligence, they were able to arrest him. So today, for the first time, we have arraigned him before court. And because there are still some few loose ends that we need to tie, the police will continue with the investigation. But because of the interest generated by this case, we intend to do a daily trial of this matter. We have already prayed to the court to let us do a daily trial of this matter beginning Monday. So we should have served him with all the necessary documents by Wednesday so that we can start the trial on Monday. And thankfully, if you get a daily trial, we might end this case in just two weeks. He is a flight risk. Somebody who has left the jurisdiction before, we cannot be sure he will not escape. Considering the gravity of the offenses and the punishment that is likely to be meted out if he's convicted, we, have, we are talking about a minimum of eight years and a maximum of 25 years for each of the counts. If we succeed in our case, he might be going in for a long time. So if the court allow him on bail, we might be left holding the cheeky end of the stick. We might not get him to try. And we also say that it is in his own interest because the anger, you can gauge the anger in society. You can reach out to it. You can see that people are hungry. For over 15 years of practice as a lawyer here, I've never seen this number of persons in court before. And this is the first time I've seen almost the entire society at court. If such a person is turned loose, we might not even get him to try because people might take the law into their own hands in order to prevent that situation to the court to keep him in custody and keep him until we end this trial. This, our society ought to learn one thing, that oftentimes they say that the case did not go anywhere. You see, this case is entirely in the hands of the witnesses. If the witnesses are coerced, or if they even are persuaded not to turn up, you cannot, it's due process. Well, it's that last point that the principal state attorney on this case made that um, we, we're going to be engaging Bright Appear shortly on that. The length or the outcome of this case entirely depends on the victims and their families. And we'll tell you why. And we got to know as well uh, that the prosecution is saying that the victims of this um, defilement are seven. But during the press briefing, the principal state attorney you just heard said the victims were actually 12 and that investigations are ongoing and there could be more girls who fell victim to uh, this, this MC uh, who is alleged to have defiled them between the ages of 10 and 13 years old. Now, Bright Apia, executive director of uh, Child Rights International, is joining us on Zoom. Zapia, thank you so much for joining us here 
on Ghana tonight. I mean, does it concern you that until these children were assisted to record their ordeal at the hands of this MC on video, which went viral, maybe we could have never gotten to know of what they were going through. It was because of this viral video that this matter was even taken to court. If, if we are to discuss it in a context, or looking at it from the geographical point of view, uh, and looking at the work that we've done across the country, I, I, I perceive that this became news because the, the children recorded it or somebody assisted them to do that. That is why it is news for that we are talking about. And for that matter, I see the kind of interest that we are generating uh, towards this particular issue because uh, in the northern part of this country, there are a lot of things that are happening that relates to that, that in certain circumstances are discussed among uh, community members. And uh, it's very difficult for you to take some of these things on because of uh, the nature of it and how sometimes they tend to protect uh, people that uh, engage in this kind of act, especially um, teachers who are who are set posting to some rural communities and all that because they also come from the point of view that uh, these uh, the community where they are teachers find it very difficult to accept a posting to those areas so when they when they have one they want to do everything possible to protect them irrespective of uh, the offense that they they've committed so clearly it's 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 something that is generating this kind of interest because of uh, the viral aspect of it. But if it is left in the hands of the community alone, in my opinion, I don't think that it would have generated what we are discussing today. But you see, that's the concern, is it not? Because, I mean, this, this is the viral video, I mean, which we can show uh, our viewers of that even ignited this whole court process in the first place. So what can be done to create that safe environment for children who are abused sexually or otherwise in, in this community, for instance, to have the confidence, the boldness to, to go and report and not have it recorded on a viral video. So it goes, I mean, on video, it goes viral and that's when action is taken. There are a number of, a number of cases that when you even want to pursue it, and the parents of the children are not willing to be involved, the whole community are not willing to, to, to be involved and all that. So it makes it a bit difficult for you to pursue some of these cases. But whatever it is, I think that uh, issues about children, uh, the state has a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, share in it, in terms of how we protect our children and the system that is required for us to do that. And we expect that everything will work mechanically to ensure that the protection of children are done in a manner, not only when issues has happened, but also to look at the preventive aspect of it. So if we are experiencing some of these things, that we know that our safety net is so weak that we will not be able to provide some of these services, then there's a need for the state to also look at legislations that would enforce prevention and in this case, if you are talking about prevention, you're also talking about empowering the community members who have certain level of understanding to approach issues that relate to children in a manner that will not escalate to a level where they would also be looking at their interest in order to protect uh, uh, the image of the community. In most cases, it's about the image of the, uh, the family, the image of the community, and even sometimes in school or churches and all that. So the emphasis should be on what do we do to prevent or what do we do to ensure that community members have some level of understanding on issues of child protection so that when people are taking steps, we can quickly deal with that. The other aspect of it that I would look at is how active our system should respond to issues relating to children mm -hmm. and the kind of punishment regime that needs to be spelled out clearly so that when it happens and, and we find it in, 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 in the safety net, all the institutions that are in there will be able to perform their duty 
clearly in a manner that would also serve as a deterrent uh, uh, to those who commit such offenses. And in and, and such cases, I, I lay more emphasis on the decision of our court system and what they say, uh, you know, because at least the, our, our, our legal system is not only about uh, um, looking at criminal cases, it's also a policy making institution. So sometimes within their legal powers that they have, they should they, be able to make to. a statement that will inform policy so that in design of our framework, we can we'll follow some to. of these. Uh, in fact, it is uh, on that particular law bit, uh, Mr. Pia, I recall that some 14 young boys were sodomized by a teacher um, in their community, right? Uh, this was a couple of years ago. Now, it had to take you, some NGOs, who had to take up the bills, the medical bills of these young boys who were sodomized. So there's a system failure there, and you are also pointing to a certain failure or deficiency in the law as well. How should this be addressed? The simple way of we looking at addressing some of these issues has to do with what um, we need to enforce within our constitutional framework to ensure that we defend the right of children. If children must go to the hospital to get a medical report, and that medical report would inform what the subsequent actions that will be taken either by the police or the court, and there's a price on it, then that is injustice. It, it is unfair to our children that they have to go through that. So it means that we are becoming selective in terms of the kind of justice that we give to our children, because if they don't have the money, then it means that they will not go through the, the, the justice system uh, fairly, and, and, and they will not have the means of even doing that. So for me, sometimes, because it borders on human rights violations, it is important that we also use the same instrument to call for certain things to be done for our children. For instance, if you feel that uh, uh, getting a medical report will, will hinder uh, the, the, the outcome of the case, then why not? We need to go and seek for interpretation of that particular provision and see what the court will say in respect to that particular case so that if it's becoming a barrier, then we can easily remove it to, to make children have a free access to, to some of these things, that would also facilitate the kind of system that we want to build, especially when it comes to our judicial system and then also prosecution. So it's, it's, it's one way that we can also use to uh, get things done. And for right. me also, I think that the state must be proactive. And for the state to be proactive, I think that as citizens, we should respond in a manner that would let the state know that the interest of children is paramount, and that is a constitutional right of every child, that anything that concerns them, the state requires that uh, their, their interest would also be represented and their welfare will be a paramount decision of the state and any other body or any other institutions and all that. So this kind of enforcement would also put pressure on the state to do what is expected. What has to be done. And, and uh, we, we, we are looking at a situation where uh, we'll get to a level where most of issues that concern children will go through that kind of interpretation system Indeed. so that that would also become a law that we can also look up to and say that uh, we can use that means to also fight for the right of our children. Mr. Pia, I appreciate your time and, and thank you. And, and it is that call you make about the issues of children being of utmost concern to the society is what leads us to this other issue because there's a grave act of cruelty that has come to, to light in the OT region where questionable adults have assumed legal authority and tied children to trees for claims of they being involved in minor infractions. Now, two such cases were found in the Crutcher West and Jessica District within the last two weeks. Here's a report that we found. Take a look. A boy of about 10 years old was tied to a tree in the bushes on July 22, 2023, at Old Chantine, a fishing community in the Cratchit West district of the Oten region. 
The victim, Emmanuel, claimed that a suspect, Kobe, a.k.a. Apache, tricked him into the woods that he was going to carry some stuff from the next community and then accused him of stealing his bread. The victim, who is not enrolled in school, is reportedly staying with a fisherman identified only as Kwabina. The Karachi police later rescued the victim and arrested the culprit. I haven't looked at the footage. It's like that they were preparing the child for slaughter because no human being should be put into that situation. And so I don't think it is the best for this particular child to be given back to the parents. But in any case, who... Uh, this is an issue as well that um, some of your viewers brought to our attention too. We're following quite closely in the OT region and um, we understand that people who have been taking the videos when these children were tired and so on are also um, subject for investigation in these two instances at least. But coming up next, the Economic Community of West African States, um, of course, uh, is also modeling the idea of invading Niger as uh, the ultimatum to reverse the coup ended yesterday. We, we have the trajectory of the situation in Niger and what experts are saying will be a possible outcome if there is a military invasion as well. And Colonel Fessel Sabadji retired is gonna be joining us shortly. But we've been looking at the possible scenarios, right? And um, let me take you through this. This is um, the, um, the uh, directive by ECOWAS, which elapsed yesterday okay and um, what has led to um, some engagements as well on Thursday we understand now ECOWAS demanded that President Mohamed Bazoum remains the legitimate president of Niger and then also called for the release and reinstatement of the president and also rejected any form of resignation that may come from His Excellency President Bazoum and also, ECOWAS affirmed that they were going to use all measures, including force, to restore constitutional order in Niger if demands are not adhered to. In a week, the ultimatum is in a week. Now, closure of land and air borders between ECOWAS and countries, that's ECOWAS countries and Niger. It is this one, the closure of the land and air borders between ECOWAS countries and Niger, which is also having some ripple effect. And I'm going to tell you shortly. And the other one they talked about was institution of ECOWAS um, measures as well. And the immediate measures they've, they've decided to take is a freeze of assets of Niger in ECOWAS central banks, or the freeze of assets of Niger state and the state enterprises and parastatals in commercial banks. Also the suspension of Niger from all financial assistance and transactions with all financial institutions a travel ban and asset freeze for the military officials involved in the coup attempt, including their families. These are the measures that ECOWAS immediately has taken um, against the coup um, in Niger, and that's generated some reactions as well. Now, on, on that particular closure of the air and land borders, here's what we're finding out. Ghana um, is one of the biggest importers of onions from Niger. In fact, from the last data we checked from OEC, in 2021, Ghana imported $33.1 million of onions, mainly from Niger. In fact, just from Niger alone, $21.7 million in that particular year. And then China, $8.3 million thereabout. Now, I wanted to take a look at what's happening to the onion importers who are, who are set to bring onion to Ghana. They are stuck as a result of this. Take a look. So that's what's happening now. And these are the onion trucks you see. And the last time we spoke to some of the drivers of, the, uh, of these onion trucks, a number of them are going bad as a result. And because of the closure of the, of the land borders, they are unable to transport the onions from Niger, and they've been able to move to Burkina Faso. And there's a closure of the border as well there. And so that is impacting. These are almost, from the last time we counted, 70 trucks carrying onions. That's what you see there. And a number of them are en route to Ghana. And 
from some analysts, if this continues, it could possibly influence uh, the prices of onions on the market in the coming days, and that's quite concerning. Ken Ofeso Sobaji, this is Credit Analyst, is joining us. Ken Ofeso Sobaji, retired. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. First of all, I want to find out your thoughts about what's happening now, especially because after this uh, ultimatum elapsed, ECOWAS is mulling the idea of uh, possible military intervention in, in Niger. Well, I toyed around with about four, four possible scenarios. Uh, one is, is very easy that the initial ECOWAS attempt um, doesn't succeed without too much of fighting because the CNSP, the Council for Safeguarding the Homeland, are able to, you know, mobilize public opinion and resist the pressure from the ECOWAS, the AU, the international community. So they remain in power. And the ECOWAS is left with no other option, you know, than, than to, um, you know, find a way of engaging with them. Uh, because if they pursue that, they might, you know, suffer some cat catastrophic uh, failure. Failure. You know. And or they will jeopardize the attempt, you know, by the three francophone countries. Mm -hmm. Guinea, Mali, so actually for Guinea, Mali, Burkina, and now Niger, you know, um, they will jeopardize their efforts against the fight against terrorism by the jihadists. And under this scenario, I see the possibility yeah. that Niger can leave maybe two or three of the sub regional. Uh, you know, security arrangements that we've entered into. One is a G5 Sahel, you know, although that is not very likely because Mali and Guinea and Burkina Faso are all part of it. Of it. In fact, already we understand a delegation from the military government of Mali and Burkina Faso have expressed solidarity with the Niger coup leaders. How does that impact on ECOWAS's front in going into this meeting on Thursday? The case of Makisa, we never heard a statement from ECOWAS condemning uh, Makisa for trying to re-engineer the constitution to go for a third term and make the argument that all the time that I've already said are not part of the new constitutional provision. ECOWAS didn't say anything. We have the case of Alpha Conde, which mm -hmm. instigated the coup in Guinea. ECOWAS didn't say anything. We have the case of uh, Cote d'Ivoire, right? Wakara, yes. who also re-engineered the constitution to go for a third term. And indeed, Wakara has said that he's only going to leave the political scene if Laurent Babo and Conan Bédié, you know, also uh, state that they are going to leave politics. Then we have the case of Togo in 2015, where the sitting president re-engineered the constitution and washed away or washed out all that he had said as belonging to his father. And so starting a new time. And all that the court said was, that's to the opposition. Okay, allow him time, and then after that he goes away. So Equus is being inconsistent, and Equus is being indiscriminate right. in the application of the same protocol you know, the protocol on democracy and good governance of 2001. Mm -hmm. And that is a challenge. Don't let us forget that we have this onion trade right. uh, with Niger. Exactly. And, I... and, and that's where the concern is. And uh, Ken Officer Sobaji really appreciate it. And this is something we're keeping an eye on, this onion situation. And uh, with, with the drivers as well, we will definitely be touching base tomorrow and do an, an impact assessment of that. Appreciate your time. Ken Officer Sobaji, retired, is a security analyst. Thank you so much for staying with us here on Ghana tonight. Join us same time tomorrow for some more. I'm Alfred Kansi. Have a good night.
Ghana Tonight is brought to you by Flamingo Paint, superior durability, superior hiding, superior coverage, simply superior.